I want to welcome everyone here this morning. It is February the 19th, and this is our week before our break, which will be next week. So I want to finish up, actually, the book of James this morning, and uh, then we'll uh, be able to start on uh, 1 Peter next time. Uh, hope that uh, you're enjoying the class and profiting greatly from it. We were looking at the prude man in James and that the prude man has certain qualities and when we got down to chapter 4 and verse 1, we noted that the prude man is free of worldliness, covetousness, and envy that produce certain things. Uh, it produces he is free from these things that produce strife in chapter 4, verses 1 through 10. Uh, then we would see that he is free from evil speaking and judging in chapters 4 and verses 11 and verse 12. Then he is free from self-reliance in chapter 4, uh, verses 17 and 18. All right, excuse me, chapter 4, verses 13 through 17. I don't know where I got 17 and 18 on that one. And we ended up in our study last week at that point, about to go into chapter 5, where this man is free from now oppression, chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. In chapter 5 and verse 1, he says, Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. The phrase, go to now, is the same phrase that's back in chapter 4 and verse 13, go to now. Uh, now then, though, he is, and it deals with the idea of come now, or listen, hearken to this. And he's going to deal with, uh, you rich men, come and listen to this, hearken to this. These rich men uh, were, in this case, not Christians. And we'll, uh, I'll state four reasons as to why they were not Christians, or why I conclude that they were not Christians. But uh, we might uh, state, uh, tie into that, Matthew, the 19th chapter, and verse 24, where Jesus says that it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle uh, than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Well, that's the type of attitude that we're going to see here, because apparently these rich people are trusting in their riches. But I said that there were four reasons why we conclude that these rich men are not Christians. <clears throat> The first of those reasons is that there is no exhortation to repent. Uh, you would expect if these uh, rich men were Christians that, and they were in the type of state that James is describing here, that he would have exhorted them, you need to repent, you need to change your life. <clears throat> he doesn't do that here. There is no exhortation to repent. Second, there is no admonition to a better life. And that ties in, of course, with the idea of repentance. Uh, but we do uh, separate it because he doesn't encourage them. You would start doing and living this way. Uh, you live the way that uh, you should be living. A third w uh, reason is that there's no promise of reconciliation to God. Uh, there's, and that ties in with number four, only judgment or condemnation awaits them. Uh, if, they, if we were expecting uh, them to repent or that they could repent and such, that there would be that reconciliation to God if they did repent. Uh, but now then, he doesn't even deal with that aspect. <clears throat> All he says in relationship to these uh, rich men is, Judgment or condemnation is waiting you. There's no call to, to repent. There's no admonition for better living. There's no promised reconciliation to God. There's, no, there's only condemnation that is waiting them. How could we 
consider these men now as Christians in that type of a, of a state. These are four areas that you would expect to see at least something said if he was dealing with those who were Christians. We would also add that there is no sin, per se, in being rich. In fact, there are many rich people who, who are righteous people as well. From all indications, Barnabas, uh, who was a good man, son of consolation, he was apparently a rich man. Uh, Philemon, uh, whom the book was written to, uh, was a slave owner, and uh, being a slave owner, you would expect uh, him being, uh, from the world standard, a rich person. Uh, David was certainly one who had great wealth, King David in the Old Testament, yet lived a righteous life, one who was after God's own heart. Um, thus, there's no sin, per se, in being rich. Even though, and again, we go back to that statement uh, that it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God, yet riches themselves are not uh, wrong. We, we need to view riches from, uh, first, how those riches were obtained. Were they obtained legally? Were they obtained rightfully? Um, there are, within the scriptures, uh, different ways which the Bible authorizes us for to obtain riches. Were these riches obtained in those ways? Uh, as opposed to in an unauthorized way. Uh, if we obtain riches uh, from the standpoint of, for example, uh, mistreating others, which we're going to see within this context, then it's wrong. If we obtain them by, uh, for example, nowadays, what we see a lot, uh, gambling or the lottery, that would be wrong. Uh, because those things are not authorized within the scriptures as to the way in which we obtain riches. Second, we need to view riches from the standpoint of how it is used or how they are used, how those riches are used. Are we using them properly? Are we using them to simply uh, enjoy ourselves? And this kind of brings the third idea, how are, are we view riches from how it is enjoyed, what confidence we place in it. Do, does this become our security? Do we place our trust in riches? Or do we uh, place our trust in God and thus use those riches for the furtherance of the cause of Christ and for the kingdom of God? Say, if we're using them in that way, then certainly riches are right. If we placed our confidence and our security, if we're using those riches simply to please ourselves, then it's wrong. And if you go back to Matthew 19 uh, and verse, well, we mentioned 24, where it's easier for a camel to go through uh, the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of life, or the kingdom of God, uh, he's really dealing there with those individuals who place their trust in riches, and thus that aspect of it. They have their confidence there instead of in God. That's the individual. There's no way for that individual who uh, to be saved, as long as he is placing his trust in riches instead of, of in God. Now then, these rich men were to weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. It is those, and he's again dealing with the context here, is those who misuse riches, and uh, go back to chapter 4, and the latter part of chapter 4, those who leave God out of their plans. Those are the individuals who are going to weep and howl. The word weep is from the Greek word kolok, uh, Kaleo, uh, and it is actually a mourning or lamenting, and it often is used in relationship to repentance, a weeping over sin. But now then, James is using it here as a weeping because of despair within their life, 
and because of the situation that they are now in. It is a mourn of a lament of despair. How is from the Greek word oluzo, and it means to shriek. It is a scream of uh, anguish and utter woe. It is equivalent to what we would see in the Old Testament many times in the book of Isaiah. Uh, in Isaiah 13 and verse 6, Isaiah 15, 3, Isaiah 14, verse 31, Isaiah 16 and verse 7, Isaiah 23, verses 1 and verse 14. It's that type of a, an utter woe that has come upon them. And so a howling, they weep, they mourn or lament, because of the despair that they're in, they howl with utter woe. Now then, it's interesting the tense of the verbs that James uses here, though. When he uses, or he comes to this word, uh, weep, he uses a tense that indicates you begin to weep. Then he says, when he says how, it is a continuous action. So you begin to weep, and you continue to howl, uh, would be an accurate way of, of translating this phrase. Begin to weep, continue to howl for your miseries. The word miseries is from the Greek word talaporia, uh, talaporia. And it denotes hardship, sufferings, or great distress. And here what we're going to see in that in verse 9, actually, it is because of the final judgment is coming upon them. And we'll notice that in just a moment. Uh, so they, a terror, a hardship, a suffering, because judgment is coming upon them, and so they begin to weep. They continue to howl because of this misery, this hardship that is coming upon them. Now, again, within the context, he is denouncing the rich for the edification of these poor saints who are suffering at their hands. He's not writing at this point in time to the rich. He is uh, dealing with the rich. He's writing to these poor saints. And it's the rich who are abusing them instead of comforting them, instead of helping them out in their uh, state. And they are misusing them, as we're going to see here in this fifth chapter. <clears throat> And so he's writing to these poor saints, edifying them because of their suffering from these rich people. And <clears throat> I think another interesting point that we can make in relationship to this is that while the riches and poverty, either one of them, doesn't really make any difference, those are outward circumstances. And they do not relate directly to the state of the soul. However, the inner state of the soul is many times affected by the outward circumstances. Uh, look at just history. And uh, instead of dealing with our history so much right now, but I'll mention it in just a second, go back to Israel in long ago through the period of the Judges. During a time of peace and prosperity, they left God. Well, the outward circumstances and state of the soul cause them to become self-sufficient, so they leave God and start worshiping idols. God brings an oppressing nation upon them. They are under oppression, and so what happens? They realize their need for God. They turn to God in repentance and plead with him to send a deliverer. He sends someone to, del to deliver them. The outward circumstances affected their inner state. Well, so it is in our society today, let's face it. Uh, we have become, within our society, self-sufficient. We don't have need of anything. We are, in this 
to a great extent, rich as far as the world's goods are concerned. And <clears throat> But, <clears throat> as is often the case, those riches have affected our spiritual state. And we don't see in so many Christians today a zeal for God because they're self-sufficient. There's no, and in society itself, there's no zeal for God. They don't care about God. And even those who believe that God exists, there's no concern about God and what God says. The outward circumstances of wealth and prosperity and peace, those things have affected the state as far as the inner state of the soul. Uh, and thus, when we come to James 5 and verse 1, these rich men, it wasn't simply their riches. It was, yes, the riches affected their spiritual state because that love for riches in this case. And so, verse 2, your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. The riches here refer to the produce of the field, the flocks, the stores of grain and wine and oil that they had laid up in their granaries. It does not here have reference to money, gold and silver and such like. And so these excuse me, are the riches that he's talking about in verse 2. He says that these riches are corrupted. It is from the Greek word uh, sapo, and it means petrified, or that they are rotten. So here's your riches, your produce of the field that's laid up in these granaries ha is now rotten. They're putrefied. They're worthless. And it's interesting, again, going back to the tense of the verbs here. It's in the perfect tense, which indicates an action that took place in the past that is once and for all action, and it does not need to be repeated. So at some time in the past back here, your riches, your the that which was in your granaries, your produce of the field and your flocks and such, they became rotten and it stayed that way. There's no need for it to continue or for it to happen again. Not does not need repeating. And thus, they are corrupted. Uh, not physically, of course, there, but from God's standpoint. But it had already taken place. Uh, notice, your riches are corrupted. Your garments are moth-eaten. Uh, and as we come down into um, uh, the next verse, verse 3, we'll see uh, that it, ye have heaped up treasures together for the last days. Uh, and he's dealing with those individuals. They had become corrupted in these ways. Uh, the word garments here, your riches are corrupted now in your garments, is from the Greek word uh, hamation. Hamation. And it describes the outer garments, what one would easily show off. And that's the, kind of the indication that we're getting here in James your garments, that which you would show off and be proud of. Look at my new suit kind of attitude. Uh, look at this new tie. Why, this suit cost $1,000, uh, to use our, kind of an illustration of our day and age, uh, showing off the outer garments. Well, these garments really are, are moth-eaten, he says. And again, it's in that perfect tense. It's already taken place and does not need to be repeated. Verse 3, he goes on, Your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. <coughs> cankered is from the Greek word 
Kati e o o, and it means to rust through. Here is something that it's not just has a little bit of rust on it, but it is totally covered with rust. It is rusted through and through completely. And again, in the perfect tense, an action taken in the place once and for all does not need to be repeated. So your rich, uh, your uh, gold and silver is cankered. Now then, note, while we said your riches in verse 2 did not deal with money, here your gold and silver does deal with money. Um, he uses a different word, the rust of them. While your gold and silver is cankered, it's rusted through. Uh, then the rust of them, he uses the Greek word uh, eos. And it actually does mean rust. So uh, we might uh, translate it your gold and silver again, cankered. But then it's rusted through. The rust of it is going to be a witness against you. Uh, it is a describing now of a hoarding of their money and not using it properly. <clears throat> and James, though, is using a description that is going to ultimately characterize all material possessions uh, and also going to indicate uh, the end of those who hold wealth improperly. Uh, you can go back to Matthew, the sixth chapter, uh, and verses 19 through 21 uh, along that line. Uh, there is that aspect. They hold wealth improperly, and it's going to be destroyed. Gold and silver that he uses here, your gold and silver, they do not literally rust. And so we see the figurative nature that James is using. It is through the hoarding of these, the gold and silver, the hoarding of money, that that money becomes corroded in God's sight. It's not literally rusted through or cankered, but it is as far as God is concerned because it's not used properly. Um, and the ruin of the hoarded possessions are going to testify of what these individuals, these rich people are, and what their end shall be. They're lovers of money. They place their trust in money instead of placing their trust in God, and they are going to be destroyed by God as a result of that. The eating of the flesh is as it were fire. Shall eat your flesh as it were fire. Uh, again, figurative language that James is using. The riches that furnished all the pleasures that these individuals were enjoying in their physical life, they're going to turn into the fire in judgment and cause them to suffer that punishment of eternal uh, hell fire. Uh, and might tie in many passages along the line of the punishment of eternal fire. Uh, Matthew 25, verse 41, Mark 9, verses 40, verse 44 and following. Uh, 2 Thessalonians 1, 6 through 9, uh, Hebrews 10, verse 27, Jude, verse 7, uh, to name uh, just a few. The rust of these, the gold and silver, eats through and destroys the metal. So greed and the love and the trust of money will destroy them. Uh, and could also tie in uh, the resurrection of the body on that. It is going to be a bodily resurrection, as we are taught in uh, Matthew, the fifth chapter, verse 28 and 29. Uh, and Mark 10 and verse, or Matthew 10 and verse 28 and 1 Corinthians 15. Ye have heaped up treasures together then for the last day. The word for there is the Greek word in. And it means in, by, or with. Here, it's dealing with the aspect of in the last day. 
ye have heaped up treasure together for the last, or in the last day. The last day has that period, uh, deals with that period of time from Pentecost of Acts, the second chapter, to the present, and on to the end of the world in which the time in which Christ comes again. That is the last days. Now then, notice that James affirms that they had first lay up treasure for themselves. Notice that phrase, though, it is laying up treasures for yourselves. They weren't using it to help out the poor. They weren't using it to further the cause of Christ. They weren't using it for God. They were using it for themselves. That goes back to what we studied last week in the first part of chapter 4. Uh, here ye lust and have that ye may consume it upon your own pleasures, on your, your own self. Well, James affirms, you've heaped up treasure together in the last days, but you're heaping up that treasure for yourself. Then, second, he affirms that it was treasure that was laid up in the last days. Now is what he's saying. You're heaping up that treasure. You're laying up that treasure now. Uh, and the treasure they had laid up was condemnation or destruction or fire. And in reality, that is what their conduct deserved. They deserved condemnation. You might uh, compare with that Romans 2 verses 4 through 6. And going back again to Matthew 6 verses 19 through 21, uh, by the heaping up of treasures on earth instead of treasures in heaven, heaping up treasures for their own pleasures instead of for the service of God, and for their own pleasure instead of helping others, they were going to reap eternal destruction or fire, which was their, what their conduct deserved. Now in verse 4, he says, Behold, the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud, crieth. And the cries of them which have reaped or which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of the Sabaoth. The scene now that James uses is the harvest. And during this time the rich man's wealth is going to be greatly increased by his new crops. And the phrase kept back by fraud is from one Greek word, uh, uh, afusterio, afusterio. And it literally means having been kept back or held out by you. And this goes back to the Old Testament law that the hire could not keep the laborer's wages even overnight. Uh, he had to pay the labor on a daily basis. Uh, study Le Leviticus 19.13, Deuteronomy 24, verse 14 and 15, Jeremiah 22.13, Malachi 3 and verse 5. They had to pay the, way, the labor every day. And in New Testament times, the wage of the day wa labor was so small that they literally lived on the brink of starvation. And if the wage was withheld from them, they didn't eat. Generally, within our society today, it's not like that. Uh, we, have, we get paid not on a daily basis, but sometimes weekly or bi-weekly or even monthly. And if we, don't, if we miss a payment, uh, we usually aren't going to starve. We still have food that's stored up and such. Well, that's, that wasn't the case with these day laborers. They didn't work, and they didn't get, if they didn't get paid that day for their work, they didn't eat the next day. Now then, here's these rich people have all this money, and they don't pay the day, way, uh, the day laborer now. They keep it back. They hold it back. And that wage now, he indicates, the wage, the money 
that he is due is crying out. It's yelling to God for justice. The word crieth here is from the Greek word uh, krodzo, and it means to yell or to scream for vengeance. There's a screaming out for vengeance by the actual money that should have been paid to the, to the labor. And this labor, it indicates, has been tricked or he's been cheated out of his money. And so the money cries out, but now then he also says the cries of them. That is the individual. They labor now. While the money cried out for justice, now then the man himself, the day laborer, is crying out to God. While um, crieth in relationship to the money was from that Greek word krodzo, meaning to yell or scream for vengeance, now then, in relationship to the laborer himself, he uses a different word, the cries of them, and he uses the Greek word boe. And it is to, this word means to cry out as a manifestation of feeling. He's been hurt, uh, not physically, but from a mental standpoint. And his emotions are now hurt because he had trusted this employee in that case, or employer in this case, to pay him the honest day's work. And he's cheated him. And so he is now crying out because of his feelings. The money cries out or yells or screams for vengeance because of the injustice that has been done to him. Well, I know James is dealing with a specific type of a situation. There is certainly the application uh, that needs to be made to our society today in relationship to the employee and employer relationship. In that relationship, the employer is to pay those who work for him a fair and honest wage. He's not to exploit the workers. Likewise, the employee is not to de uh, defraud his employer by being lazy, by not giving him an honest day's work, and so forth. That Christian who is a worker for someone should be the best worker that that individual has. The one who owns a company and who employs people should be, the, and he's a Christian, should be the best employer that a person could find to work for. And when you have that type of a situation, uh, you're going to have a, a good type of a situation even in our society. Uh, the principle that we see here, I think, is found many places within the scriptures in relationship to slave and uh, master relationship. Uh, for example, in Colossians 3, verses 22 through chapter 4 and verse 1, I think that relationship that we see there would be similar to the employee-employer relationship. And uh, what we will study in 1 Peter, uh, we'll see that in a relationship also. Uh, but we do see this. The, the Christian is to be honest both from the standpoint of the employer in paying his employees and the employees in working for the employer. Um, and sad to say, so many times nowadays, that's not the case uh, when it should be. Uh, notice that he says that their cries have gone up and are entered into the ears of the Lord of the Sabaoth. Um, When I was young, and possibly you did this as well, but when I read that, uh, I thought it said Sabbath, the Lord of the Sabbath. Uh, in fact, I think I've heard people read it, Lord of the Sabbath. It's not Sabbath, it's Sabaoth. And if you look at the Greek word, it is literally, it has been transliterated into our English. And if... Uh, 
the Greek letters have just been brought over into the English letters, and the Greek letters are Sabaoth. Uh, it means in English, host or armies. And it is signifying here God's might, God's power. God is, he, these cries are going up into the ears of the Lord of hosts, the Lord of armies, dealing with his might, his power. He is all-powerful being. There's only one other time this word is used, and that's in Romans 9 and verse 29. Uh, he uses this term, Sabaoth. But it is used repeatedly through the Old Testament times. In the situation in the first century, the poor had no one on earth to really defend them. Uh, why should they in many cases? I mean, they were poor. There was nothing that these poor people could do in order to, to pay for a lawyer or pay for someone to defend them. And so anyone who could have, why should they? No reason to. Uh, but he is indicating while no one on earth defends you, the God of heaven is. And he's mighty. He's powerful. And God, that all-powerful being, is going to grant to them justice in the end. He's the one who's going to take vengeance for those individuals who have been defrauded of their money. In verse 5, he says, Ye have lived in pleasure on earth and been wanton. Ye have nourished your hearts as in the day of slaughter. You've lived in pleasure and again, he's dealing with these rich people. These rich people have lived in pleasure. It is from the Greek word uh, trophao, or trufao. And the root meaning of this word is to break down. And he is dealing with uh, the idea, or it is describing a soft living of self-indulgence a pampering of the flesh. And this is what literally destroys man's moral fiber. That's what he's dealing with here. You've lived in pleasure. What is it? This pampering of the flesh has sapped your moral fiber from you. That's why they would defraud the, these day laborers of their money. Um, we would see this pampering of the flesh maybe a few years ago. I don't know if it's still on or not. You saw a show uh, that would go around and show all of the these uh, rich people's houses and what they would enjoy and some of the things that they would uh, use to pamper their flesh. Well, that's the type of idea that's being expressed here. You lived in pleasure. You've pampered yourself. You've become soft. Soft living, self-indulgence. You get everything you ever wanted. And as a result, he says you have been wanton. Uh, this comes from the Greek word spatolao. Uh, spatolao. And it is a worse word than the pleasure word. It means to live in lewdness and lasciviousness. They had indulged their sinful, their sexual appetites. They had used their possessions, which they had gotten wrongfully by fraud, to gratify their own love of comfort, their lust, and had forgotten their fellow man. But we are also reminded that whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. In choosing this path of indulgence, fulfilling the lust and the sexual appetites that they had, they chose the end of it as well. Ye have nourished your hearts as in the day of slaughter. Nourished is a form of that word pleasure, in a sense. Uh, it's the Greek word trepho. And it means to feed and then to fatten. 
some of you might deal with animals a lot more than I do, and maybe cattle. And But this is expressing the idea that to fatten up an animal real quickly, you provide all of the food that that animal can eat. You'll fatten him up. Now, it won't be necessarily good, but it will fatten him up. Well, these rich people's hearts were supplied everything that their hearts desired. Anything that they wanted, they had it. And they would go get it. The result is they desired nothing but luxury. Uh, go back sometimes and read Amos, the sixth chapter, and notice uh, specifically verse 1 and then verses 3 through 6. But that entire context shows that individuals just living in luxury, the lap of luxury as we sometimes put it. And what they had done is they had fattened themselves for the day of judgment. As cattle were fattened up, given everything that they wanted to eat, to fatten them up for slaughter, God is going to slaughter them in the last day. Verse 6, he says, Ye have condemned and killed the just, and he doth not resist you. Condemned is a Greek word, katadikadzo. Uh, katadikadzo. And it indicates a trial that was legally obtained or legally arranged to determine the guilt or the innocence of the accused. The only problem here is that the guilt of this individual had already been arranged. It had already been determined that he was going to be found guilty. And thus the trial is a mockery of justice. It's determined beforehand. You condemned. You've indicated, you've arranged that he's going to be adjudged guilty, and so you go through this mock trial, a mockery of justice, to sh and he's showing in this that these rich people were able to control the courts, and they were able to get and secure sentences in keeping with their wishes. You've condemned these people. Uh, you've set yourself up to where you can judge someone guilty, control the court to where the outcome is whatever you want it to be. The word kill uh, is the Greek word uh, phonio, or phonio, and it means literally to commit murder. It's not just simply kill, and we need to remember that all, not all killing is murder. All murder is killing, but there is some killing that is right. Uh, when a government, which has the obligation to, to punish the evildoer, Romans 13, uh, when, he, when the government executes that individual, then that's killing that individual, yes, but he's not murdered him, and he's not guilty of murder. This word, though, is that word that means to commit murder, the taking of life unlawfully. Well, they have murdered the just. The word just is from uh, the Greek word uh, dikaios, and it means righteous, upright, innocent, or guilt guiltless. So here they had gone to the court, they had a predetermined sentence of the court, and they carried out that predetermined sentence, and the poor does not have anyone, we are seeing here, to defend themselves and does not defend themselves in this lawsuit. Now then, the question, though, that we need to raise is, who is the just or the righteous that is being discussed here? Well, I'm going to give uh, three reasons why that I believe that it is talking about Christ here. Ye have condemned and killed the just. And in reality, the phraseology, context, all the facts point to 
that he's talking about Christ. First, the Greek phrase itself, and um, I'll paste this in, uh, even though it has some Greek phrase, words that uh, you probably won't even come through properly in the chat room, but the Greek phrase, ton dikaion, is singular as opposed to plural. Back in verse 4, we saw the plural words, uh, that the cries of them, uh, the laborers, plural, them, plural. Here, it's singular. And thus, it is, ye have killed or you've murdered the just one, or the righteous one, not the righteous ones, plural, but the righteous one. And so it's singular as opposed to plural. Why would he change in the context from the plural to the singular if he is not dealing with Christ now? Second, Christ is repeatedly dis mentioned as being the just one. He has, where's that title, of just or righteous one. And you can uh, study Acts the third chapter verse 14, Acts 7 and verse 52, Acts 22 verse 14, uh, 1 Peter 3 and verse 18, 1 John 2 and verse 1. All of those have reference to Christ, but it refers to him by this term, the righteous one or the just one. So that again indicates a, that here James is talking about Christ and not these individuals who have been uh, unjustly uh, put to death uh, and their money kept back by fraud. A third reason that I believe that it refers to Christ is that Christ did not resist those who put him to death. He humbly submitted himself to their persecution without reviling them, without speaking back or uh, talking back, uh, without complaint. And study Isaiah 53 and verse 7, uh, Acts the 8th chapter, verse 32 and 33, 1 Peter 2 and verse uh, 21 through 23. And so because of these three reasons that uh, we just enumerated, we believe that when it says, ye have condemned and killed or murdered the just, he is talking about Christ, the just one, Christ. He did not resist you. The word resist is the Greek word, and we've mentioned it before in our classes, antitasso. And it's a military term to stand against and indicates to rage battle against. He didn't wage battle against you, uh, against these individuals who put him to death. But within the context of James 5 now, realize that Christ becomes a type of all of those who have, done, who have died unjustly for the cause of right. Uh, and might tie in with that what Peter writes in 1 Peter 4 and verse 16. Uh, if a man suffer as Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. This also shows the close connection between Christ and the body. Those who are Christians. You cannot separate the two. Uh, whoever, when you mistreat Christ, you mistreat the, or when you mistreat Christians, you mistreat, mistreat Christ as well. You cannot separate the two. And so however we deal with other Christians is how we're dealing with Christ. Now then, we come to another aspect of this, and we see in verses 7 through verse 11 that this individual is going to be patient. And because the time uh, for this hour is up, we'll go ahead before we start entering into these verses and take a break at this time and then uh, start back with.